there's going to be an impact of carbon pricing on how we eat. Beef will be a lot more expensive. Chicken and pork probably cheaper. Well, not they, they will be more expensive, but they won't be as big a difference. Um, and of course, the, the biggest single factor that makes beef more expensive is the fact that cows belch and fart and methane comes out of both ends, and that's a greenhouse gas 30 times worse than carbon dioxide. Vegans and vegetarians will find the cost of their food going down, especially if they buy organic food, and meat lovers will find they're having to pay more for their carbon footprint. So there's financial pressure to move towards a healthier uh, diet that is less dependent on animal products. And of course, that frees up a lot of land as well. I did a few calculations there of what the impact would be on beef, cheese, salmon, etc. Uh, the high end, of course, is beef. But again, these are just guesstimates, and there are a lot of other factors that come into it. We'll also see the end of food burning. My uncle Floyd, who you saw in that picture with the two horses and me when I was two or three years old, died a couple of years ago, but we visited him in Iowa three years ago. And he just looked at me and said, I never thought I'd see the day when the government paid us to burn food. But that's what they're doing. 3,000 acres, and that's just their farm, growing food that is expensively converted into alcohol in order to give farmers something to do. Humiliating, really. The other thing that came out of the Paris talks is Red Plus. RED is a program that will reward farmers or people inhabiting an area not to cut down trees. At the moment in Brazil, the, if you value the carbon at $20 a ton in a hectare of rainforest, that hectare of rainforest is worth $15,000. If you cut the trees down and turn it into cattle pasture, it's worth $300 but they're cutting the trees down and turning it into cattle pasture because nobody's paying them to keep that carbon standing in the form of a tree. So we'll see big changes there. We'll also see changes in architecture. I'll just throw this in. Concrete, steel, and glass, and aluminium all use huge amounts of fossil fuel energy to produce them. And that's a cost. All those emissions are, are free for the manufacturer. When those have to be internalized, the price of those building materials will go up. Wood, because it's sequestering carbon and uh, putting it away, it will be rewarded. And so the differential between using wood or concrete beams will be dramatic. And architects are busy working on this. And the first really stunning example will be in Vancouver in a few years' time. How can we regenerate soils really quickly? Well, the answer is organic farming, um, composting, mulching, and this is where I've promised Peter not to go too commercial, biochar. This is what I do. Uh, I buy charcoal or produce charcoal, grind it up, mix it with mycorrhizal fungi, actinomycetes, bacteria, and all these other biological organisms. And farmers and growers use it to accelerate the buildup of soil organic matter and to keep their plants a lot healthier. It, when you put it in the soil, it reduces your need for f added fertility. It increases the moisture holding property of the soil. And its biochar, once it's in the soil, stays there pretty much forever. There are examples from the Amazon basin where they've been using biochar for 3,000 years, and that's how they built those legendary cities of gold that the early Spanish and Portuguese explorers described, but which disappeared when smallpox wiped out most of the indigenous population. Biochar is, comes in many different shapes and forms and sizes. So for turf, you'd use the finer sizes. For trees, the larger sizes. Um, I jumped a slide here. Nope. Yes. That's what it looks like magnified. So if you're a mycorrhizal fungus or a bacteria, 
you crawl into those little caves, because in the soil they're also, I didn't mention this earlier, the equivalent of saber-toothed tigers. They're mites and amoeba and archaea and various little organisms, arthropods, little creatures that go around gobbling up bacteria and fungi. So when they can go into those little cavities, they can protect themselves from the predators and continue to lead their charmed existence, being fed sugar by the plant, all of that. The first farmers to adopt biochar in the modern world were the farmers in Belize who grow, grow cacao for green and blacks. And we took them to Cornell University in 2008, and we had a two-day training program in how to make biochar, how to apply it, from uh, Professor Johannes Lehman and Professor Stephen Joseph there. They went back and got to work. And Kraft, who then owned Green and Blacks, bought 10 biochar kilns for them so the farmers could produce biochar out of their prunings. Within, by 2012, they were getting UNDP grants and now Inter-American Development grants, and now they don't even get any grants. They just get bank loans because they've expanded their cacao production because the trees they plant are healthy, they start fruiting in three to four years instead of six to seven years, and they now actually are, their cacao is so sought after that as of this year, they won't be supplying green and blacks anymore because there are people in America who are desperate for the quality that they can provide, and they're a little bit small for green and blacks. They set up nurseries, you can see the difference, the ones on the right didn't have biochar when there was a drought. Uh, we supply white salads down on the Isle of Wight. They're getting 23% yield increases from using biochar. So their, their technical guy said, I don't even want to tell my boss that's that because they'll think I'm making a mistake. But you know, it's happening. Stockholm is using it to restore their urban trees because being a tree in a city is really difficult, the compaction, pollution, everything else. And the trees have a much thicker crown when they're planted in what they call the Stockholm solution, which is a mixture of chopped up granite and 30% biochar. And Qatar, in they are trying to create parkland in the city of Doha, and they also have been using uh, Carbon Gold's biochar to uh, encourage the healthy growth of trees. That's the end of the commercial. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Forest Green Rovers have used it on their football pitch. It makes a huge difference to football pitches, but there's a slight catch there, which has, we, we're working on. They need to improve the drainage on the pitches because biochar is so efficient at retaining moisture that in the winter, the, it gets a bit slippery at times. So they've kind of had another look at that. Slash and char is a... Uh, farming method, I don't know if you know what slash and burn is, but basically farmers cut down sort of secondary growth, grow a crop or two or three crops on the land, and then leave it for five or six or seven years to fallow. The stuff grows back, and then they chop it all down and burn it again. With slash, so there, it's a very inefficient way of using land, and half a million, no, sorry, 500 million hectares of farmland are still being farmed with slash and burn. If that converts to slash and char, it means that that land will be four or five times more productive because it won't be spending so much time fallow waiting. Now I'm going to move on to the, my third or fourth theme, the human biome. And the idea that our guts are the equivalent of roots. That everything, if you just turn everything inside out that I've said, you have the human biome, um, where plants and the fungi, all the microbial world that owns a plant is spread out underground, away from the plant in an expanded way. In the case of our type of organisms, which evolved after plants, we have the soil inside us. So we're just, you invert the whole thing, but you have the same situation. You have uh, aerobic organisms closer to the surface, anaerobic ones further down. 
These organisms in our digestive system produce all the antibiotics and nutrient conversion processes that you get in a soil. It's just that it's happening inside rather than outside. Uh, what happens when somebody uh, has dysentery or something that wipes out that colony? Well, you've got your appendix. And people, doctors used to chop out your appendix pretty much almost like tonsils and adenoids. We now know that no matter what happens to your gut, all of your key gut flora are still safely tucked away in the appendix, ready to recolonize you once whatever has been causing your problem has been overcome. And another way to regenerate the gut flora is charcoal biscuits and eating charcoal. Uh, dogs don't have an appendix, which is why there are probably five to ten times as many charcoal products for dogs as there are for people on the market. So let's just follow those comparisons through. The gut and the root both do absorption. They both harbor large complex groups of microbes. And the microbes are very closely related. Sometimes they're even you know, the, same, the same families, just slightly different, adapted for the different environments. They regulate gene expression. They provide metabolic capabilities. So they're actually little factories taking the food you eat and turning it into what you want. And the Polydvine project, a European project, showed that a lot of those nutrients get stored in the gut wall and they're just waiting until you need them and then an enzyme will convert them into uh, whatever nutrient you need. So those are the nutrients it provides. It's your immune system. 90% of your immune system is in your gut. That's where your defensive microorganisms are. And they learn very quickly. As soon as something comes in that they're unfamiliar with, they figure out how to beat it, and then they multiply that particular defensive biology in order to do it, which is exactly what happens in the soil. Worms can be beneficial. In the soil, an earthworm for every Actinomyces bacteria it eats, six come out the other end. So the worm is acting as a fermenter for these protective bacteria. Roundworms and hookworms have been found to be very effective at modulating people's immune response so that you don't have a heavy anti-inflammatory response, but you still deal with the problem. So worms are not all bad. And as I said at the beginning of this point, the roots, our roots are our intestinal villi and the lumen of large intestine. They reach inwards and a plant's roots reach outwards, but it's the same thing. The um, mm, geophagia is a long established practice that they've never been able to stamp out in modern times and you know, it used to be highly respected in previous times, Pliny, Hippocrates, uh, all emphasize the medicinal value of eating soil. You know, not only, you know, the expression, I am soil, actually refers also to you are what you eat. And eating clay is r beneficial, particularly for uh, arthritic conditions, nursing mothers, uh, pregnancy. Um, in China, the goddess Kuan Yin, who is kind of, you know, uh, in, in Buddhist terms, probably as close as you would get to the Virgin Mary, and that sort of uh, appeal to our spiritual yearnings, is associated with mercy clay, uh, a clay that was not just eaten in times of famine, but as a medicinal clay. And in Haiti, there are factories producing mud cakes. And I don't have the exact recipe, but it's clay fat, salt, and pepper. And the biscuits here contain clay, coconut fat, and charcoal. And there's something else I can't quite remember. And soil also is important for our outer biome. Uh, Moroccan Rasul, French Argile, uh, clay-based shampoos all reflect the fact that getting earth on your skin helps to nourish that biome. In 1970, 
677 when we had the heat wave, uh, the cover story on Seed Magazine, the magazine we published was the case against washing. It was really the case against shampoo and soap and anything that destroys the biology of your skin. And you know, confession time or you know, boasting time, I haven't washed this hair with shampoo since 1963. And it's still there, looking at <laughs> some of my colleagues here. <laughs> Going back to Norway, where this talk began, I went back there for the first time. I'm the first descendant of Lars Olsen Dugstad to actually go back to the ancestral farm, where I found directly related descendants of the same great-great-great-grandmother and a more distant cousin called Olaf Dugstad, who is pioneering organic farming there. He's growing organically and making lactic pickles out of swedes and carrots and beetroot and cabbage. So drawing together both the nutritional and the organic farming side of it. To return to my introductory coats about soil, you know, these are the authorities that have informed my perspective on all of this. There is a higher authority, God, <laughs> who said, uh, from soil, from dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And for you, for those of you who isn't, that isn't enough of a high authority, I have Margaret Atwood, who has said sequestering carbon in soil by means of biochar has the added benefit of increasing soil fertility. We are the children of the soil. If we kill our mother, we are killing ourselves. It's time to regenerate. We know how. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was brilliant. Does anybody have any questions? Remember this chocolate. <laughs> and charcoal biscuits. Okay. Don't forget the biscuits. I was going to pass this around, but I think it's going to be tricky. So. Because we're um, filming this, could you stand up and speak loudly when you have questions? Yeah, they, 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 we are in the charcoal heartland of Britain here. The iron industry and really the industrial revolution started in Sussex, mainly in the Weald, because the Romans brought over sweet chestnut and planted them all along the Weald which is heavy, far, heavy soil for farming, but great for trees. And in fact, if you had come to, gone through the weald of Sussex in the, and Kent in the early 1800s, you would have been appalled by what a horrible mess it was, because everywhere there were charcoal kilns belching fumes into the air. And it was, but, you know, it made high quality cast iron that made cannons which Sussex iron masters sold to the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, all of Britain's enemies were buying their cannons here because they were cheaper and better than anywhere else. That ended when coke was invented. And coke, you take coal, you take out the gas, and that then was town gas. And what was left, the charcoal, was, would burn at the same high, the coke would burn at the same high temperature as charcoal. To make it now, there are kilns, and actually we make one. There are lots of other technologies, sort of a varying cost, depending on how much you want to make, that are, that are efficient at making biochar. You get the, so compared to the old technology, you get twice as much yield with 90% lower emissions. Um, and you can do it with a, a 200 liter, uh, sorry, 200 gallon oil barrel, just oil drums are the simplest crude method. The other thing that's happening though is there are now in Huntingdon and about to come in Greenwich, large uh, processors who are gonna have the ability 
to churn out biochar at a much lower cost than currently. Um, and part of that is because the raw material they're using would have otherwise gone to landfill and cost money, so they're actually getting a subsidy by avoided landfill cost. Um, I would recommend buying our product simply because <laughs> we've already added the mycorrhizae and all the biology and seaweed and we've ground it to the right particle size because you want a blend of zero to five uh, millimeters with a predisposition towards the zero to two millimeter side. I um, can't actually write the formula down for you, but it's that, that I, I think if you're gonna do organic farming, do the farming. Um, you know, I mean, we supply a lot of uh, organic producers and they, they really, you know, they're, they're best at producing the food and let us specialize in what we do. There was, uh, yeah. Yes, the question was, is the 30% of food, or the 70% of the world's food produced by small farmers uh, fed to animals? Or is it just the other that is? Small farmers feed grain to animals. They keep chickens and pigs and that sort of thing as well. Um, the 30% that's grown on industrial farms tends to be, is more likely to be genetically modified to be grown on a larger scale using more herbicide and chemical fertilizer and so inefficient that it can't operate without subsidies. So, but everybody, there's a balance. All food ends up either in a human stomach or an animal's stomach and the animals are included in that calculation. The Soil Association allowed human manure, which is also known on less uh, glamorously as sewage sludge. Uh, it was allowed up until 1993. Um, as long as it was pathogen free and didn't have any heavy metal residues in it. Then the European organic regulation kicked in and it prohibited any human manure. Um, Thames Water uh, at a recent Soil Association conference had a side session pointing out that the human manure is now cleaner than ever because since 1990, all new build has been segregated and all industrial waste is kept out of that supply line. So it's as clean as it has ever been, cleaner. And the, then they were lobbying for the Soil Association to try to get it back into a permitted status. Uh, the Soil Association has always been devoted to what Albert Howard, Sir Albert Howard called the rule of return which is what you take, you should put back. Uh, at that gathering was the agriculture minister of Hesse. It's one of the 13 German lands, 12 German lands. And so I asked if he could comment on that. And he got up and said, at a meeting of the agriculture ministers of all the German lands, we unanimously agreed that no human manure will be used on any soil in Germany, organic or non-organic, forest or farm. And it was really, you know, there's a huge mountain to climb there. In America, they also have that attitudinal problem. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, yeah, the campaign is going on, but it's one that isn't, is, is there are some very big, just, you know, people who frankly had problems with their toilet training. <laughs> and there's, there's another fact. I lived in Germany in the 1950s. And if you got stuck behind what was called a honey wagon, that was the worst thing because they would take raw sewage, the farmers would pump it into their honey wagon and then spray it on the fields. And when we lived there, when we bought vegetables, my mother would soak them in a chlorine bath before we could eat them because otherwise, you know, we didn't know what we were going to get. Um, in, 
London in uh, the piggeries, which were around Portland Road in sort of Holland Park area, trucks used to come with London's waste every day, uh, carts. They would feed it to pigs. The pigs would eat it. The tapeworm eggs would then lodge in the pig's body, and the pig would then, the same carts would take the pork sides back to London for Londoners to eat. So, you know, things were pretty, those, those kind of historical problems. And then people had trichinosis and tapeworm, and that created a negativity about using that material in China. Night soil has always been an important part of farming. But again, if they want to sell organic food in Europe, they have to comply and in America, and they do. They provide most of the sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. Because they now farm in Heilongjiang province, uh, one and a half million hectares of contiguous organic land. They are the most efficient organic farmers in the world. And so they've taken over from the farmers the, who were in little islands in North Dakota and South Dakota who used to grow all the beans and seeds. And, but they can't use human manure. So the non-organic farmers can, but the organic, and British farmers do. You know, if, you, you know, if you're an NFU member, there's no problem. You can spray it on your land, but you can't if you're organic. It's tragic. Anyway. Uh, I, well, the Thames water, uh, they process it. They bake it. That kills the eggs, and that's all you have to do. They just, there's a bit of temperature treatment. Then they pelletize it. And that's what, you know, 90% of Britain's farm, well, I don't know how many are using it, but it's, it's widespread. So we are, you know, we're not, we're not flushing it all down the Thames anymore, but it's, 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 yeah, it's there. But, and it's very high in phosphorus. And, you know, phosphorus is a, a mineral in short supply. So there's somebody back there, and then I'll come back. Yes. I think if the government decides what people should grow and how much they should be paid, you run into problems, and that's part of the problem. And they decide what agricultural methods they should use. If the carbon market, whether it's carbon pricing or carbon taxes, influences behavior, then I hope I've shown that the benefit, that it would change behavior because people would be farming for, with the carbon element in mind. At the moment, the organic farmer does, but gets no reward for it. The non-organic farmer doesn't and doesn't have to, isn't punished for it. Uh, yes. Rock dust, um, I think there's a hell of a lot of it. I mean, they're just, what, it's just one quarry in Scotland is supplying the whole country's rock dust needs. Uh, we will continue to quarry rock uh, for probably millennia. And, so I, and, I, and it's good stuff. I mean, I know Jennifer who runs the company, so, but, and she keeps trying to get us to mix it with biochar, and one day maybe we will. But um, no, it's, it's, it's very sustainable, and it's a very effective way, because quite often it's just manganese or some mineral, and you don't want to have to go to a laboratory, have them analyze your soil and say, OK, here is a bespoke formula of synthetic or you know, separated chemicals that we've created to restore the deficiencies in your land. Rock dust is cheap. It puts in, you know, you can't have too much of the good stuff. And it's just as effective as, you know, a more complicated approach. Kelly? Oh, perlite and vermiculite. Um, they, I, I'm not sure whether what happens to them at the end of their lives. 
Um, I know with rock wool, it goes to landfill. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them, but then biochar <laughs> fulfills most of those functions of lightening the soil and creating porosity and, you know, so, so I'm probably not qualified to answer that as effectively as, I can have a look and, you yeah. know. Yes? I think it's molecular biology. I'm just telling what your question was. Because oh, the question was, is there a future potential for GMOs in orga organic food? In, tandem in organic practices. Yeah. yeah, in tandem with organic practices. Um, when GMOs first hit the market, it was the molecular biologists who had been working in sealed labs, destroying all of their everything they'd produced to make sure nothing leaked into the environment, who led the charge against Monsanto's release of Roundup Ready soybeans, was the primary one, into the environment. Since then, uh, molecular biology, which is the science that underpins GMOs, has come a long way. There's a, the fifth biggest seed company in the world in Holland is Reichswann. They produce if you're a cabbage grower in Germany, if you grow tomatoes, cucumbers, or lettuce, you use their seed because it is the best. And their tomato seeds, for example, they have mapped the total genome of 150 different strains of tomato. And if you're a farmer who's growing in a certain climate with a certain day length, and you want tomatoes that are a certain size and ripen over a certain period of time, they can basically tap what you want into a database of all these genes and naturally breed a tomato that fulfills what you want. And that is, that is happening. And molecular biology is those seeds are being used by organic farmers. They are not prohibited by organic farming because it's not taking a gene from a petunia or a fish or something like that and putting it in. And you don't get unintended consequences as a result. So yeah, the, the, the potential of molecular biology to really be of benefit in agriculture in very specific ways for farmers in stressed conditions is, is, is huge, but it's still in its infancy. How much time have we got, by the way, Peter? T oh, 10 to 8, OK, ten. all right. Yes? Yeah, OK, imagine you have a field of rich soil with a thriving microbial population healthily balanced, so when any pathogen comes in, any fungal disease, it, they immediately see it off. You put NPK in the soil, the plant hoovers it up because it's a soluble form. It's in exactly the form that the plant would be getting it from the mycorrhizae or the rhizobium, the nitrogen producing bacteria in the soil. So the plant isn't motivated to exude a plant. When, it, when a plant drops, drips that sugar out, the exudate it's called, it's, it's giving anything from 20 to 50% of the sugar it's making in its leaves is going down, usually around 20, the lower end. The plant stops sending the sugar down because it's getting all those nutrients for free from the farmer. So that's, that's that mechanism. But when, those, when that microbial community in the soil dies off, it doesn't really die, it sporulates. It just forms, it lays eggs of itself, waiting for better times. And, but they're not active in the soil anymore because they haven't got any food. The sugar's gone. So they die down to a minuscule level. That's the opportunity for pathogenic fungi and bacteria, the ones that are going to attack the plant, move in. Well, if you're ICI and you're selling the farmer an NPK fertilizer, and then the farmer comes back and says, I've got terrible rust problems. Oh, don't worry, I have this fungicide for that. Oh, and so that's, that's the issue with that. Yes? Yeah. 
it, the blood fission bone is going to break down more slowly. So it's not so readily available. And a lot of it actually feeds the biology in the soil. And then the biology in the soil feeds the plant. So, it, you know, the, it, it's not, it's, it's the speed and the total accessibility of NPK that cuts out all other biology. Lady next to you. The, the mechanism, everybody has a different way of doing it. And the beauty of the Paris talks is all the governments have done up till now is they've gone in and they've submitted their INDCs, their intended national determined contribution. In other words, they've said, we're going to be emitting this much by 2020. And there's a five year review. So the next review will be in 2020. And they'll all be, so you've got a group of 150 countries or so who are in a peer group pressure situation. Now, I may be Prime Minister of England and decide I'm going to, or of Britain, and I'm going to have carbon taxes. The French have decided it looks like carbon taxes. The Americans are going for carbon markets where people are trading carbon back and forth, but you can have cap and trade so that you only allow this industry to do that much and people are controlled in that way. Um, you know, in some places, they might just go in with a gun and hold it to your head and say, reduce your carbon, you know, total coercion. I don't know. You know, there, there are, but there are about four ways, including coercion, that you can get it to work. And each, and you might even use different methodologies for agriculture than you do for transportation. Because it's up to the government, ultimately, of these countries to get there, but they want to do it without spending any money. And in fact, most governments are beginning to realize that they can make money out of carbon taxes. And so one of the issues is going to be, is that money going to be hypothecated back into emission reduction? The answer is probably yes, because they make money out of that as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's early days, but every method that has been tried works to some extent. And the big problem has been Europe for years tried to do it all on its own and didn't dare. Even though WTO said you can tax stuff from China or India if they aren't having the same carbon regime, nobody dared to because that would have put up the price of refrigerators in John Lewis. And um, you know, they, nobody wanted to be responsible for that kind of pressure. No, that's a good question. There's a lot of criticism of biochar was, oh, people are going to, uh, that doesn't, I don't make the decision about the biscuits and the chocolate, by the way. But <laughs> the, <laughs> there, there was, uh, you may remember George Mombio, who wrote an article in The Guardian many years ago called Chips with Everything, in which he really kind of slagged off biochar. So did Vandana Shiva. They've both realized that actually, there is so much waste. Every time, you know, if that, that building, the slide I showed you of the skyscraper in Vancouver, any time that wood is used for floorboards or paneling or anything like that, there's a huge amount of uh, peripheral waste, the branches that aren't the main beams or boards. And there are a lot of programs around the world where invasive species are being removed in order to reclaim farmland. Uh, this is true in Namibia, Cuba, Australia, quite a few places. So a lot of that stuff used to just be burned. Um, it, a lot of it still is being burned, but the availability of feedstock for biochar is still far greater than the amount that's being used. As waste segregation becomes more and more commonplace, and it's happening everywhere. You know, you used to have to separate your stuff. Now all waste goes to conveyor belts where people push the glass one way and this kind of plastic that way and all of that. The biochar appropriate waste, garden waste, all that sort of stuff, 
we'll all be part of the feedstock because you can make, I mean, we work with rice farmers in Laos who have carbon gold kilns. All of their rice husks used to just sit in big piles, rotting away, bubbling methane. Nobody really knows how much, but you know, there was not very much, there was anaerobic fermentation going on and the methane, which is this powerful greenhouse gas, was just going in the atmosphere. Now they're turning it into biochar and spreading it on their rice paddies and that reduces the methane emissions from the rice paddy as well. So, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think we've hit the ceiling by a long way on that. I wish, I wish, I wish it was a problem, but it's. I use olive oil and salt. So I sit in the bath. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit in the bath with, you know, if I take a bath, I'll put a kilo of salt in the bath, Himalayan pink sea salt, rock salt, and maybe half a liter of olive oil. And then that's the whole, that's for everything. Thank you for that. Um, the, when we started Green and Blacks, most, the farmers we dealt with and most farmers everywhere in the world dealt with what in the Central America are called the coyotes. They're the guys who go in a pickup truck, drive into a village and say, okay, um, picking up your cacao, which farmers have kind of made, they've fermented it, they've dried it, they've put it in bags, they've put it in the dry place. The guy turns up, he says, oh, but the price is 90 cents a pound this year. Oh man, it was 125 last year. Yeah, well, you know, world market prices. And the farmers don't know, you know, they didn't know, they didn't have smartphones, they didn't even, in Belize, they didn't even have telephones. Um, so there was a, a lot of screwing of the farmer. Um, we went in and started dealing direct with the farmers and setting out, and that's how we got the fair trademark because it was our enlightened self-interest to be sure of a supply. And it, the, to do that, you had to guarantee the farmer a price. And so that's, that's how we did it. Since then, Barry Calibo, who are the biggest producer of, when you buy artisanal chocolate, if it isn't actually made from cocoa beans on the premises, they've probably used Barry's couverture. Mondelez, who own Green and Blacks, have taken the Belize model and have invested $400 million in rolling it out in Ghana, Ivory Coast, and Indonesia. So those middlemen are being cut out. And every chocolate company, Mars is doing the same, Nestle are a bit slow, but even Hershey, which I really found hard to believe, it's just last year, are doing it. So they're all, they recognize that if they don't treat the farmers well, if they don't have a transparent supply chain to satisfy their investors and stockholders and customers, that their future is going to be restricted. And also, the boot is shifting to the other foot. If I'm a cacao farmer in Ghana, I also have Michelin and Firestone and Bridgestone saying, don't grow cacao, grow rubber. We'll pay you this much for latex because you know, all these cars are being made. Every car has five rubber tires. You know, that's an issue. Then you've got Unilever coming along and say, no, plant oil palm. Um, and so the, the, and also everybody's eating nuts these days, cashew nuts. A lot of cacao farmers are being tempted to go into cashew nuts. So it's no longer, the, the farmer is no longer the underdog. You know, there's a lot of talk about how the cacao farmer's average age is 60 and they're all you know, it's the end of the world. You know, that's also rubbish. You know, if you go to a cacao farm and say whose farm it is, the person who's farming it may be 40 or 30. But as long as dad is alive, that's the farmer. And so it, it warps the reality of the statistics. And young people who everybody thought was were gonna go off and drive taxis in Accra or Abidjan or whatever, are staying on the farm now because there's a future. In Belize, it's incredible. You know, when we went there, when we first went there, there were a thousand acres, allegedly, that had been planted with cacao. When we actually drilled into it, there were probably about 300, 350. All the rest had been planted, 
during the aid program and then abandoned because the price had gone from $1.75 to $1.25 to $0.90, cents to $0.75, cents and then to $0.55. Cents. And the farmers just said, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to work for that kind of money. Now they're, you know, they're getting premium prices. Everybody wants it. Uh, an Austrian chocolate company, Zotter, sent out a whole camera crew to film the farmers and film the trees. And now if you're in Austria, you think, oh, Zotter, a wonderful country. Look at all this wonderful stuff they're doing in Belize. But, you know, and that's fine. You know, they can have it. But it, so, so the state of the cocoa industry in Sri Lanka, the prime minister read about what we did in Belize. And he's now commissioned a team to research their cacao industry, which is a third of what it was 20 years ago, 6,000 tons down to 2,000. And they're planning to invest heavily in regenerating it.